on you. God, I thank you for every single person here. May you pour out blessing after blessing. God, may you touch our lives in every single way, God. I pray, Lord, that we just leave everything at the door and we just come in awe and worship you. We just usher you in. God, I thank you for your presence. I thank you for who you are. And I thank you that you are a good, good Father. I pray that your fire would just fall upon us, God. And we just give you all the praise and all the glory. Amen.
it's such a blessing to be in your presence, to be able to serve you, to be able to give. And we're thankful for you and who you are and the way you've worked in our lives. Yeah. We just love you, Lord.
body. We are the power of God lives inside of us. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody, bless the Lord. Somebody thank you for setting on fire this morning. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. We bless you and we honor you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You're worthy to be praised, God. You're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy. Somebody say it this morning. You're worthy, Lamb of God, to be praised and to be honored. Today we join the angels of heaven and cry out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Worthy to be praised. We join the chorus of heaven this morning. Somebody help me praise God. Oh, bless his name. Hallelujah, bless his name. He is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Ooh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Bless his name, bless his name. Hallelujah. Let's go ahead and declare that what we're about to hear is the word of God. If you have your Bible with you, would you hold it up, whether it's your iPad, your electronic device of any sort, if that's got your Bible in it, let's hold it up and let's just declare those who are in the uh, Sunday school this morning, those children, uh, you're uh, dismissed this morning to go to Sunday school. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I feel the Spirit of God in this house this morning. Let's declare. Repeat after me. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will never be the same. I am about to receive. The incorruptible. Indestructible. Ever living seed. Of the word of God. Say this, I will never be the same. Say it again, I will never be the same. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you would remain standing, we're going to read from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. You may say, Pastor, I think you were there a couple of weeks ago. You were. We were. And I want to just go back and talk about having a vision of God and what that does for us as his people. We talked about that, having a vision of God, but today I want to reinforce a couple of things and I want to move forward. When we see God, we also see ourselves. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne. Say with me, he's sitting on the throne. High and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Say that with me. Holy, holy, holy. He's holy. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me, for I am undone. Say, I am undone. Now say it like you mean it. I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word this morning. You may be seated. Father God, I thank you for your presence. Lord, we know that it is your anointing and your power and your Holy Spirit. God, that causes this word to be alive to us. And Father, I pray that you would bless my mouth, Lord, that the words that you have given to me, God, that they would be said, that they would be pleasing in your sight, God. Lord, that 
you would just, uh, by your word, just cut to the heart, Lord, and just stir and rekindle the fire that you set a long time ago in us, Father. We give you praise for it. And everybody said, Amen, Amen. As we look at this, we see that Isaiah is touched by what he has seen. And we're going to see that not only is he touched, but he is changed by what he has seen. You see, it's one thing to come to church and experience the anointing and the power of God and get juiced up a little bit and get some Holy Ghost goosebumps. How many know what I'm talking about? Amen? Uh, where you just feel good all the way, you know, down to the soles of your feet. There's one thing to experience the power and the presence of God, but it is another thing to walk away totally changed and renewed in the power of God. So as we look at this, here Isaiah says the very last thing that we read, for my eyes have seen the king. Aren't you glad this morning? That you can know the king. That you can have a relationship with the king. Uh, that he's not a God that's a far off. He's not a God that uh, set everything into order and simply walked away and told us to do the best that we could. But we have a God who is ever present in the time of trouble. He is a God who is with us. He is Emmanuel. He is the God who lives inside of us. Oh, praise the Lord. I'm so glad that I can have a personal relationship with him. He is not a God that is so far off, but he is a God that lives and breathes inside of us. I am who I am because the Spirit of God lives inside of me. Can you give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning? And as we look at this passage, there is trouble, there, is, there are situations, there is the unknown. And we talked about that the last time. We live in a world where we don't know what is going to happen when we wake up in the morning. When we look at the news, we, we might be surprised. It may be the same thing. But what I want you to understand is that God has not left the throne. That God is still sitting on the throne. It doesn't matter what the enemy has tried to portray to you. And the Spirit of God would say this morning, don't live in fear, but live in the power and the glory and the fire of God. So we see this situation. And last week we said that maybe Isaiah said, where was the Lord in all of this? Well, the answer to that is that he was sitting on the throne and that he is still sitting on the throne. Can I get an amen this morning? You see, the Lord God sits upon the throne as the sovereign ruler of the universe. There, is, there might be other powers, but they are lesser in power. There might be other authorities, but they are lesser in authority. And what I want you to know is that God has never been kicked off the throne. He has never been removed. He has set everything in order. And it is going to his plan whether we see it or not. Come on, help me out this morning. So where was the Lord in all this? Sitting on the throne. Notice it doesn't say that he was sitting on a chair. Because anybody can sit on a chair, amen? Uh, last night I got home and I didn't do anything. I didn't go get fixed with just a little snack. And I got in my chair and I kicked the, 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 the seat up and I uh, relaxed my feet and I propped them up because my feet were sore. They still are this morning. But I was sitting in a chair and not on the throne. I might have felt like the king of my house, but he was still in charge. He was still the king of kings and the lord of lords. And so anybody can sit on the chair, but he sits upon the throne. He is the God of the universe. He sits upon the throne. Kings and judges and those with authority sit upon the throne. The book of Revelation specifically mentions the throne more than 35 times. So when we get to heaven, the throne is going to be central. So we might as well get used to thinking about him being the king sitting on the throne. Because when we get there, 
We're just going to encircle around the throne. And we see pictures of that in Revelation as they encircle around the throne. And they begin to lift up him who is high and lifted up and worthy of all praise. And so the throne is central. He sits upon it. No one has taken him off of the throne this morning. Amen. You see, here's the deal. When we begin to look at this world that we live in. The throne is central as well. You see, atheism says that there is no throne. Materialism says that only materialistic things are on the throne. All of those say that there is no higher power that we have to take authority from, but that we are sitting on the throne. That's exactly what humanism says. It says that we sit upon the throne. Well, I want you to know this morning that you do not sit upon the throne, but the King of Kings still sits upon the throne. And we must understand that because the enemy wants to come and tell you that it's all about you. But I want you to know this morning it's all about Jesus. He's sitting upon the throne. The King is still reigning and ruling. You see, upon that throne was a superior God, lifted high, and the angels of God, the seraphim, were surrounding the throne. And look at them. I believe they can teach us something about God and about our relationship with God. It tells us that with two wings, they covered their face. In other words, our God is so holy that even the angels of heaven who were created and who do not have souls and do not send the angels around on the throne of heaven, but yet they begin to cover their face because they are in the presence of a holy God who is worthy to be praised and who is worthy to be exalted. And they begin to see the light. And can I tell you, this light's pretty bright up here this morning. We're trying some things out. But what I want you to understand is they must shelter themselves from the light and the glory and the power of the light of God that rules and reigns from the throne. And with two they cover their feet. And that speaks of humbleness. They cover their feet. Can, can I tell you that our feet are one of the most lowly parts of our body. I, I wouldn't want to take my shoes off this morning in front of you because I, I, I'm just telling you, I got some crooked feet. And you'd be like, pastors, mess up. But I don't know too many people who have really pretty feet. My wife's got pretty feet. But, uh, uh, I don't know why I said that, but anyway. Uh, you, you see, our, low, our extremities, our feet, they're to be covered in the presence of God because we don't want him to see anything that is unworthy of his glory. And that's what the angels are doing. But notice they have six wings. Somebody say six. And with two other, they fly. And can I tell you that angels don't fly for the fun of it. They don't fly just to be flying. They don't just circle around and do nothing, but they are sent by the word of God. They carry a message all throughout the Bible. You see that the angels brought a message to the people of God who were desperate, who were in a situation or a problem, or the world needed to be changed, and the angels of God flew, and they worshiped God, but they did His purpose. Hear me. So when we begin to think about ourselves, now we don't have six wings. But four of the wings, two to cover their face, two to cover their feet, were about a humble approach to the throne of God. So we are not to come in lightly. We are not to come in irreverently into the presence of God. Can I get an amen this morning? You see, I know this is just a building, but when we come together, it is the house of God. And so when we, when we come with, uh, 
an anticipation of meeting the Father, of meeting the Holy God. And when we come, we ought to come humbly and we ought to come bound. That doesn't mean we don't rejoice in God's presence. But what that means is we understand that we approach a holy God and that God is a God of power and a God of authority and a God who rules and reigns. And we come humbly before him. Because he is holy. See, there's an importance of humility in the presence of God. <laughs> when I get ready to minister the word of God, can I tell you it is such an awesome responsibility to teach or to preach the word of God. And I don't want to mess up. And I want to tell God that, Lord, please guide my words. Please help me, God. Lord, I don't want to do anything that would take away from uh, what you're doing in this house, God. I, I want you to move, and I want you to uh, do miracles, and I want you to do all these things, God. And, and so help me to get out of the way in order for people to see you. How many want for people to see God through your life? So it's about humility and approaching the throne of God. And the angels cried out, holy, holy, holy. But it's not just in unison. They're actually going back and forth. So it would be like this. This side, help me. Just say, holy, holy, holy. Do it. Holy, holy, holy. Did I tell you you're supposed to stop? <laughs> Keep going. Holy, holy. Holy, keep going. Holy, holy, holy. Now over here, holy, holy, holy. And so what begins to happen is that God is exalted in the repetition. God is, uh, it tells of his authority and his power as we continue to say holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who is worthy to be praised and he is lifted up and the repetition of it in the Hebrew language tells us that it is an intensifying of the, of the power and the presence and the glory of God. And so the angels are saying, oh, he's holy, he's holy. I know he's holy. I know he's holy. He's holy, he's holy. He's worthy to be praised. You can stop this morning if you want. Thank you. You see, there's an intensifying in the Hebrew language. It tells us that it is intensified as it is re repeated. Repeated, repeated. You see, God is holy. And we don't really understand holiness. It means he's set apart. So he's set apart from his creation. He's set apart from this world system. He's set apart from his creatures that he have, has created. He's set apart from time. He's set apart from all of these things. And so he is not touched by it. We walk through a world that is full of sin. We walk through a system that is trying to lead us to a one world government. We walk through all of these kinds of things. And what I want you to understand is that we pick up some dirt along the way. But our God does not. He is a holy God. Untouchable, pure, holy, filled with light. He is a holy God. Set apart from anything that we could ever have imagined. You see, God's Everything about God is holy. There's a holy power. There's a holy love. There's a holy wisdom. And holiness is not just a characteristic of God. It is a part. It is his being. He is holy. You cannot separate the holiness from God. He is holiness. It is just who he is. His whole being and what was Isaiah's response? In light of the holiness of God. He said, for woe is me, for I am undone. Wow. He didn't say, God is here, let's celebrate and dance. He didn't say, let's get out the instruments, although there's nothing wrong with that. 
But what I'm trying to tell you is when we get a true vision of God, we will see how holy He is. And we will cover our face and we will cover our feet and we will be prepared to do whatever God has sent us to do and to work His work. I want you to understand this morning that God is holy. There is nothing like Him. And so Isaiah says, I'm undone. Today's vernacular, I'm falling apart. I'm falling apart, God. Because when I see you in light of me, and you see there's two things he saw that helped him feel unworthy in the sight of God. The angels, which were doing what they were created to do, and then the vision of God. And as he saw those things, he said, woe is me, I am coming unglued. Anybody ever felt like you were coming unglued? I'm undone. I don't even know what to do in the presence of God. Woe is me. And, and they be, he is listening to the angels who are crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And they had a beautiful praise to God. But yet he was a man of unclean lips. And lived among a people of unclean lips. See, the more clearly you see the Lord, the more clearly you will see how bad your state is. Would you put that up there for me? Thank you. The more clearly you see the Lord, the more clearly you will see how bad your state is. Now this morning, I'm not doing this to make you feel bad. But what I want us to understand is there is a way we approach the throne of God. And it is through humbleness, and it is through understanding that he is a holy God, but yet he loves us as his children. Isn't that awesome? And he beckons us to come and to be a part of his presence and a part of his glory. Oh, that is so, uh, what a privilege of ours to come before a holy God. Yeah. You see, I, uh, Isaiah was, we would have considered him to be a righteous man. A man who had uh, served God for over 40 years. Uh, yet, when he saw the king enthroned in comparison, woe means he was in grief or despair. He was undone. It means to be cut off, to be destroyed, to be brought to silence. So Isaiah feels like he's falling apart. Dumbfounded by his own unholiness and brought to silence by the holiness and awesomeness of God. You ever notice there's a difference between praise and worship? When we praise, we're loud. We got the tambourines, maybe. We got all the instruments, the drums. And, and then whenever the presence of God ushers in, and I appreciate Kelly saying that in her prayer this morning, when the presence of God is ushered in, all of a sudden there becomes a holy silence, and we're barely able to breathe or move because we don't want to, uh, God to move out. We want God to stay. And so we come in a holy reverence before his throne. Isn't God good this morning? Yeah. I need to see what time it is. Praise the Lord. I got one more time. <laughs> Can I tell you something? When we get a vision of God, a real one, a true vision of God, a true encounter with Him, we'll have the same reaction that Isaiah did. We'll have that same type of encounter. And, and I love this quote by uh, Charles Spurgeon. God will never do anything with us until he has first of all undone us. What does that mean? Oh, God, undo me. God, take away all my thoughts about what it looks like to be your servant, to be your child. God, undo me. God, you take me apart, God, and you put me back together like you want me, God. You use me, Father. Fill me more with your glory. Help me to be more obedient. Oh, God, I do everything that I have imagined what it is like to serve you. And God, put it back in line with you. Our pastor, uh, Brother McKinley, he used to say that every once in a while, he just kind of threw everything he thought about God and his relationship with God up into the air. And he let it settle back down. And then he began, God began to put it all back together again. Say that with me. God, undo me. 
See, being undone is uncomfortable. And that's what God wants to do. He wants to undo us so that he can reactivate us and do something through us. Uzziah, the king, was a great man of God, a great king. Yet, you see, we're supposed to approach the throne of God in humbleness. He, got, he let pride get the best of him. And, got, and he entered into the house of God. And he burned incense in the very presence of God. And God struck him with leprosy. Because of his pride. But today, do you really want to get a vision and an encounter with God? Let, can I tell you, I am nothing I am nothing but a shell, but God chose to use me. God chose to anoint me. God chose me to call me uh, to preach his word. And when we come with humbleness, understanding that we are nothing without the presence of God, then he can use that. Yeah. Somebody say, God use me. God use me. <clears throat> Isaiah was undone when he saw God. I read a book. You may have read that book, that same book. It's called God Chasers. It's by an evangelist named Tommy Tinney. And he described a service that he was in. Now, I want you to understand, first of all, that this didn't just happen like that. But this church had been praying for the manifest presence of God to come into the house. Can I tell you, God will mess you up when he comes into your house. He, 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 he will just disturb you when he comes into the house because we don't truly understand God. But here they were in a service. And you may have been in a service somewhat like this where when he first walked in, he could tell something was different, that there was a thickness and a heaviness, a presence of God that was so thick that people could barely breathe. And the musicians and the singers were all struggling to play and to sing. And the atmosphere of heaven began to come down like it's described in the Isaiah 6. The glory of God filled the temple. The train of his robe filled the house. And the people were crying. And the people were worshiping God. And nobody knew what to do because God will mess you up. Oh God, undo me. Mess me up, God, that I might be more strong and more powerful in you. I just say this, God was there. And when God shows up, we don't know what to do. And so the pastor and the evangelist were both looking at each other. Like, you want to take the service? Do you want to take the service? And the evangelist, Tommy Tenney, he said, I'm afraid to take the service right now. I feel that God's doing something. And the pastor said, I, I, I just want to read one scripture and say one little thing that God is given to me. And he stepped up and he read Chronicles 7.14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. And then he closed his Bible, gripped the edges of the pulpit, just like this one, a clear one, acrylic. And he said this, the word of the Lord to us is to stop seeking his benefits and seek his face. We are not, his, not to seek his hands any longer, but to seek his face. And at that instant, what sounded like a thunderclap came into the house of God. Not the pastor back about 10 feet. The, all, the, the pulpit fell forward, split in two as if it had been uh, struck by lightning because the presence and the power of God came in. And the evangelist simply steps up and said, if you have not got things right with God, now would be a good time to do that. You see, what I want you to understand is that we live in the presence of a powerful King of kings and Lord of lords. And when he comes in in his fullness, there is a holy terror that will come. And the people didn't shout and rejoice. Instead, they begin to climb over the pews and begin to run to the altar and begin to shout, Oh, God, save me. God, cleanse me. God, renew me. And see, we, 
we get a, a, a false sense of what it means to come into the presence of God. And I don't say that to frighten you. Because those people that came to the altar within a few minutes of repenting, and by the way, that service went on to the second service and on into the night. And those people were literally laying almost on top of each other over the altar. <laughs> Only God would come in that kind of glory. In that kind of, kind of weightiness. Not to terrify us, but to change us. And they got up and they wanted to get baptized. Baptism is a sign of newness of life. You see, when we encounter God, a true vision of God, a true encounter of God, we're going to be changed forever. Somebody say, God, change me forever. Would you come to the piano this morning? One of you. You know the song I want to sing. When we come into the presence of God in that way, the first thing that we want to do is cry out, Woe is me, for I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King this morning. My prayer for you is that you would get an up-close vision of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this morning? The presence of the Almighty God not only is in this room, but is lives inside of you. And this morning, if you have a need, the king that sits on the throne is here. There's nothing too big for him. There's no problem, no matter how long it's been going on, that doesn't bow to the authority of Christ Jesus. You may have given up, but God still sits on the throne. You may have thought that that loved one has gone too far, far, but God still sits on the throne. This morning. Would you sing it with me? If you have a need, come to the altar. If you want to be prayed for, come forward. But this morning, I want to stir your heart. Oh, that we would see the Lord.